Hello everyone. Welcome to Dinesh QL. My name is Dinesh Priyankara, Data Platform MVP and Business Intelligence Architect. Let's talk about Azure Databricks. With this video, I'm going to explain you the, uh, the usage of Azure Databricks and then we'll talk about what is Azure Databricks and just like my previous videos, uh, let me show you the way of getting this environment created. I uh, will be starting with uh, something called workspace and let's see how we can create objects like cluster, notebook, uh, databases within this workspace. And I'll be adding uh, more Azure Databricks related videos uh, like uh, how we can uh, connect with Azure Data Lake Store Gen 1, Gen 2 or how we can get these uh, Azure Databricks notebooks uh, and the clusters access uh, using Azure Data Factory things like that. Okay, let's see why we should use Databricks. There are different type of implementations where you can use uh, Azure Databricks, but I'll be taking a specific type of implementation, which is uh, modern data warehousing. So I'll be showing the way of, uh, or the, the way we have been developing, implementing modern data warehousing. Then I'll show you uh, how you can use Azure Databricks with modern data warehousing. So let's see. So generally we start with uh, data sources. Nowadays we don't stick into uh, the standard relational data sources. We prefer to uh, create data warehouses with all type of data. So we'll be accessing uh, relational databases, uh, flat files like CSV or even Excel, uh, cloud databases, unstructured data like uh, you know emails, audios, videos, images, or even data streams uh, related to IoT devices. So we need to get data from all these sources and we need to make sure that we make these data uh, data sets available for a different type of audiences. Now see this. Uh, when we talk about types of audiences, we have information consumers, power users and business users. Uh, Information consumers, it's all about people who completely rely on uh, IT department. So uh, IT department will create reports, models, uh, dashboards, things like that, and they will just consume without doing any modification on it. And then we have uh, basic users. So basic users is a bit uh, advanced than information consumers. Yes, they will, they will work with or they will uh, use things that have been created by IT department but in addition to that they will create their own things as well they will be creating their own reports dashboards even uh, their own models then we have power users so power users are uh, you know advanced users when you compare with basic users and information consumers they might access things that have been given by IT department but they prefer to uh, get raw data into their environment and work with it now when you when we compare basic user and power users, basic users, even though they create their own things, they always uh, prefer to use uh, the tools that have been given in a user-friendly manner. You know, uh, it is actually the self-service BI. So they will be using self-service BI client tools for creating all their items without writing codes. That's basic users. But when it's going to power users, they will not use tools like that. They will use uh, some sort of development environments for writing codes. Uh, people in IT department, we can consider them as power users. Data scientists, we can consider them power users. So these are the three types of audience we see uh, in, uh, when, whenever we implement modern data warehousing. And then the, uh, since we try to move everything to the cloud, let me take cloud environment and explain how uh, we can implement modern data warehousing. So we'll be uh, creating the modern data warehouse. It's going to be a, a storage that contains everything related to your company. So it's going to hold various type of data. Uh, if you're going to use uh, Azure platform for this, obviously it's going to be Azure Data Lake, either Gen 1 or Gen 2. And then we'll be having our ETL or ELT solutions for getting data from these sources and push it to the destination. We have to use a compute environment specifically for data that cannot be processed using standard uh, relational database management system. So we call these data sets as unstructured data sets. So if there is a data set which cannot be processed using traditional techniques, you have to use uh, 
platforms like Hadoop or uh, within the Hadoop you can use Spark, Hive, things like that for processing your data. Even though we talk about modern data warehousing or uh, we consider the data lake as the modern data warehouse, we still develop or we still implement the structured data warehouse. This is where you see star schema, snowflake schema, if you follow Kimball's concept. So we will be implementing this as well. And then we'll be getting data from uh, our sources. Data is getting processed using the standard ETL or ELT uh, solution. And then one way is we can, we, we can send information directly to the data warehouse. Or if you have unstructured data, we can get that data processed using this compute environment and send it to our cloud storage, which is our modern data warehouse. This is how we have been implementing, but this thing has been uh, uh, slightly changed. Uh, nowadays, what we what we do is, but but you don't need to stick into these rules. You, you have to decide what is the best. But you can think like this as well. Uh, you know, you can extract data from your sources and without sending information directly to the compute environment or a structured data warehouse, you can send them to your cloud storage and store it. So in your cloud storage, you're going to have all your native data. And then you can uh, get this data processed using compute environment and you can pass the results set back to the storage. So if you think about your storage or the modern data warehouse, it contains both uh, uh, native data and the process data as well. So this storage can be considered or used as the data source for data warehouse. In addition to that, uh, if you want to make sure that uh, you have an optimized structured repository for data retrieval, yes, you can implement your enterprise model uh, using something like Azure Analytics Services and uh, data warehouse can be considered as a source for that. Once it is done, environment is ready so IT department can create reports, dashboards or module uh, to cater uh, requirements coming from information consumers. So information consumers uh, will be using their own uh, you know, interfaces uh, for accessing these reports. In addition to that, basic users, they can use uh, tools like Excel, Power BI for connecting with all these three types of data sources and they can uh, create their own things. They can use cloud as well for uh, creating their dashboards, models, charts, reports, things like that. And how power users or data scientists or IT department can work with these three sources, they can get data from any of these locations. And specifically, if they are, you know, people like data scientists, they will be using tools like uh, Jupyter Notebook or Eclipse and uh, get data from this environment. They, they, they can use cloud as well. So within the cloud, they can use uh, notebooks, Spark clusters, or even the uh, machine learning studio which is available in Nashua. So this is how we have been opening our data sets for end users. And this is how end users have been working with these data sources and creating dashboards, reports, models, experiments, uh, various type of things, right? Now, where I can use Azure Databricks? As you see, we have used Hadoop and its uh, subs projects for uh, processing unstructured data. We can simply use Azure Databricks for processing our unstructured data. But do not take it wrong. Azure Databricks is not just for processing unstructured data. It is for processing many different type of data sets. But in this scenario, we can simply use Azure Databricks for processing our unstructured data. Sometimes we use uh, you know, uh, Databricks for processing structured data as well. Uh, if the data set is really big. Okay, you saw one type of uh, scenario where we can use Azure Databricks. But before we talk about Azure Databricks specifically, let's try to understand what is this uh, Databricks exactly. So Databricks is uh, Apache Sparks based analytics service. It can be used for processing any type of data. It can be a data set related to a batch or a stream, or it can be even an experiment related to data science. Yes, it is started with uh, Apache Spark, but uh, let's try to understand the history related to this uh, Databricks. So everything was started somewhere in 2004 and 2006. Google initiated uh, big data processing with uh, Google file system 
and then we started talking about MapReduce, then Yahoo started with Hadoop, everything happened uh, somewhere in 2004 and 2006. And as a part of Hadoop, uh, Spark was introduced somewhere in 2009 and then the, uh, we started seeing Databricks in 2013. You can consider Databricks as a commercialized version of uh, Spark. So this is how it was started. So if you talk about a little bit more on Databricks, highly collaborative, entire team can work together in terms of data processing implementation and the environment is scalable. You can anytime scale out or scale down and the good thing is it supports multiple languages so if you are familiar with languages like Scala you can start with Scala or your developers might be familiar with uh, some other things like Python, Java, R they can work with these languages and, uh, and you can have one implementation that contains codes written based on multiple languages that's about Databricks now let's see what is Azure Databricks. I can simply say that uh, Azure Databricks is combination of best of Databricks and best of Microsoft. But this is what you need to understand. It is not something that has been developed or implemented all alone by Microsoft or all alone by Databricks team. It's a collaborative effort. And you should not consider it as a it has something that has been plugged into Azure uh, platform you need to consider it as a native service available in Azure. So because of that, we called it as a first party service on Azure. Setup is really simple. You can get your environment clusters ready within a couple of minutes. And two a major or important settings I see with Azure Databricks clusters are auto scale and auto terminate. Now let's talk about the scalability. This, this is something really important when we talk about distributed processing. We need to decide how many compute nodes we want for processing our data set. Sometimes we need five nodes or sometimes we need 10 nodes. Sometimes we really do not know what exact number of nodes we want. So Azure Databricks allows you to set up min and max in terms of number of nodes. I can say, okay, the minimum number of nodes I need is two and the maximum number of nodes I want is uh, uh, 10. So based on my workload, based on the, uh, the capacity it wants, Azure Databricks decides the number of nodes it needs. So why should I enable auto scale? First, if I want to save money, I can simply enable auto scale. Second, I have a data set to be processed and I have no idea on the number of nodes I want. Go ahead and enable auto scale. Third, I have an instruction set, but uh, in morning hours, this instruction set uses a small data set and in evening hours this instruction set uses a very large complex data set so in that case rather than configuring the cluster uh, in morning hours and evening hours I can simply set up and enable auto scale and set up min and max okay that's how you uh, use this auto scale feature auto terminate so auto terminate is all about getting your cluster shut down if no one is using your cluster so you can set up a time period for example I can say after 120 minutes this sh cluster should be shut down uh, if no one is using within that time frame so you can save money using this property as well this can be completely integrated with Azure data uh, sorry Azure Active Directory so enterprise grade Azure security is available with your Azure Databricks since this is available as a normal or native Azure service you can simply integrate with other Azure services for uh, getting your implementation done. How do you start with Azure Databricks? So first thing is you need to get your environment created. We call it as a workspace. So you can create multiple workspaces within your Azure subscription. Uh, it generally you need only one and uh, your team can work with your workspace. So you have to start with the workspace and inside the workspace you can create one or more clusters. Uh, one cluster can contain the you know, fixed number of uh, nodes and the other cluster uh, you can set it up with uh, auto scaling and you can say min is 2, uh, max is 8, something like that. So you can have multiple clusters within a workspace uh, for catering various requirements. And then how do you write instruction set? So you have to use notebooks for writing instruction set. So within notebooks, you can write Scala code, Java code, 
or Python, R, uh, you can write even SQL codes. We have another section called libraries. If you want to get uh, third party uh, libraries, packages into your Databricks environment, you can simply get them and then use it uh, within your code set. Sometimes you want to get uh, your instruction set scheduled as a job. So that facility also given within your workspace. So these are the things you will be configuring within your Databricks. Demo time. So let's see how we can uh, start with the workspace and how we can get a cluster quickly created and let's write a small notebook for creating a database and table. Okay, here's my portal and uh, let's see how we can get the Azure Data Bricks blade open. Uh, you can, uh, if, if you're in the home page, you can click on this to get it started or else you can go for all services and look for Data Bricks and click on it. So let, let me click on this to get the blade open. So here's the Azure Data Bricks blade and this is where you create your workspace. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you can have one works workspace for everyone and you can have multiple workspaces in your account. So let me create my workspace. Click on add and here's the name of my workspace. And I'm going to select my uh, subscription and uh, let me pick this one I'm going to use uh, I'm going to create a new resource group let me say demo and the location is Southeast Asia price in tier I don't want to go into premium because uh, we're not going to do any uh, test or demonstration based on uh, role based access so let me pick standard and uh, this asks whether you want to have a virtual network or not so we, we don't need to go into that now so let's get the workspace created let me click on create okay my workspace is available let me click on it to get it open and I can see certain set of properties uh, and uh, I can see a button called launch workspace that's the button I have to use for opening the, the workspace so let me click on it and it opens a new tab and you will see a sign-in operation as well okay I'm in my uh, Azure Databricks workspace I can see multiple sections like common tasks, recent documentation and I can see links for a quick start tutorial and import and explore data and then create a blank notebook. Uh, let's see how we can start with cluster creations because without a cluster you cannot use your workspace or you cannot get your data process. I'm going to click on clusters in this section. Let me click on it and I can click on create cluster for getting my first cluster created. So I have to give a name so I'm going to uh, mention this as cluster 01 and uh, I can pick a mode whether it's going to be standard or high concurrency. If you do not expect much uh, usage with cluster specifically in uh, you know spe specifically with concurrent connection you don't need to go into high concurrency in that case you can go for standard so anyway I'll be picking a standard and Databricks runtime version pick the latest version then the Python version uh, and make sure you use always the latest version of the Python which is version 3 right uh, you can see those two properties we discuss auto scaling and uh, auto termination if I disable auto scaling I can see only one input box for entering the number of nodes or the workers I need for getting my distributed environment configured but if I enable auto scaling I can see min and max so which mean you know my data will be processed uh, using uh, number of nodes between 2 and 8 uh, let, let me have the, uh, the default configuration uh, I'm going to enable auto terminate as well so uh, if nobody is using my cluster this cluster 01 uh, within time frame like 120 minutes this will be automatically shut down remember it does not delete the cluster it will just shut down it will basically release all your worker nodes back to the pool yeah, think like that now what's the worker type based on your requirement you need to pick the spec for your worker nodes so there are a large number of specifications given uh, based on your data set size based on the complexity of the data set uh, based on the complexity of your instruction set you can pick the bits uh, spec 
but in my case I'm going to select the lowest one which is uh, the first one and uh, I'm going to say that okay driver type uh, is same as worker that's the uh, you know, top node that's what we use for making communication so that's all I have to uh, set in terms of creating the cluster let me click on create cluster to get my first cluster created in my workspace okay the cluster has been created you can see the state uh, as running and uh, uh, we can anytime use this cluster for getting our data set process before we go into the notebook let's quickly have a, a look on the resources that have been created uh, for this workspace and the cluster let me go back to my previous tab and as you see that uh, I have filtered this page for my my specific uh, subscription so you can see multiple virtual machines have been created that's for your cluster and uh, you'll be paying for that as a part of Databricks pricing in addition to that a uh, couple of disks have been created and a couple of public IP addresses have been created so you, you, you will be billed for all of these items as a part of your uh, Databricks let's go back to the Databricks workspace and let's see how we can start with a notebook I'm going to click on the top icon which is Azure Databricks where I can see a link for uh, getting my notebook created so let me click on create a blank notebook link so it asks about the uh, no, name for the notebook let me say create database I'll have an underscore for this and when you create your notebook it asks what sort of language you're going to use inside the notebook but remember this even though you select the language as Python you can uh, work write codes with SQL or Scala inside your notebook uh, since this is going to be a, a SQL one let me expand this and select SQL so I'm going to make this as a SQL or SQL notebook but again you can write Scala code R code within this now the third drop down is picking the cluster if you have a cluster up and running you'll be seeing it in this drop down if there are no clusters you're not going to see this drop down but one thing you need to remember is you can create a notebook without the cluster getting configured why you need a cluster not for writing the code for processing the code in that case if the cluster is not exist you can simply create the notebook without a cluster but here we have a cluster so let me pick that cluster and click on create here is the notebook so uh, if you are familiar with environment like uh, Jupyter Notebook it is same so then you know how to get your codes written so in your notebook you will be having multiple cells like this and you can uh, write set of codes in a single cell and get it executed and once you have completed everything you, you can simply save it and then uh, uh, you can call this notebook attaching a cluster for getting your data process okay so let me write a code on this so this I have named this uh, notebook as a create database which means I'm going to create a database but before we create the database let's have a look on the data section related to your workspace as you see there is an icon called data let me click on it and uh, we have two panes one is for databases other one is for tables and you can see there's a database called default and no tables so I can create my tables without creating a new database so all my tables will be created inside the default and if you have uh, used a similar environment for example if you have used Hive with Hadoop then you know that you can create uh, your own databases and or else you can use the existing default database so similar concept and when it's come to table creation just like Hive you can create internal table or sometimes we call it as managed tables or you can create external tables point to the point to the data set uh, exists in a different location but remember that uh, you know Databricks uses Hive you will see it I will talk about more on this uh, with a different set of videos let me go back to the notebook since this is a SQL based notebook I can write a statement like create database let me call this as master database so that's my statement and I can click on this icon for processing it or else I can uh, press shift button hold and press enter so you can see it is getting created done let me go back to my data section 
and I can see my database so this is how you create your database your own database okay now let's see how we can quickly get a table created we are going to create a very simple table so I can uh, uh, I'm going to create a table based on a data set I have or based on a CSV file I have I can simply drag that file into this section and get it started but let me click on import and explore data and go to into a section and uh, see what are the other facilities available for getting the table created so let me click on import and explore data I can see uh, three section I can upload a file uh, I can just drag the file onto this or I can click on browse and pick the file that's one way of doing it or else I can go to my Databricks file system it's just like HDFS Hadoop file system I can go through my file folders and see whether uh, there's a file that I, that I can use for creating the table or else I can go to other data sources and pick the location for creating an external table so we'll talk about these things later let me go back to upload file and I'm going to drag a file onto this okay I'm going to drag a product file and uh, uh, place onto this it's getting uploaded done uh, now how can I create my table based on this uploaded file I can click on this to uh, get an interface open and then uh, you know define column names data types and all and get it created or else I can click on this create table in notebook to get the whole thing uh, written in a notebook and then get it executed for creating the table let's focus on the simplest way and uh, let me click on create table with UI okay so in order to get it created uh, it needs a cluster so let me pick the cluster and then I can click on preview table it will connect with the product CSV file and try to determine the structure of the table based on columns existing in your CSC file so the table name I'm going to call this as products and the column name uh, let me name this as product ID type is let me pick integer and this is product name type is string this is subcategory type is string again and this is category type is string again and let me call this as product code right that's my structure and let me go through these things uh, you can see the table is going to be created in default database uh, I'm going to pick my master database that's what we created so that this table will be created inside the master master database and file type is CSV things have been automatically detected and you can see the column delimiter has been picked as semicolon if you want you can change it but obviously it's a CSV file and no header with this file and uh, no info schema and no multi-line right that's all I had to uh, set I can click on create table in order to get it created table is created let me go into data section and see you can see the product tables under master database can we query this table yes let's go to our recent notebook created as create database and this is what we use for creating it and you should not execute the first cell let me write a statement in the second cell like select all from you need to make sure you write with the database master database dot products let me execute and see yeah it works so we have a table in our workspace or I should data bricks workspace so this is how you work with workspace and this is how you write codes in notebook and this is how you get your notebook codes executed using the cluster okay that's all we have on uh, this video let's see more on uh, Azure Databricks thanks for watching